Good afternoon. It's my pleasure to welcome all of you to the Humanities Forum this Friday. My name is Raymond Hain. I'm a member of the Philosophy Department and the Humanities Program here at PC and the Director of the Forum. The Humanities Forum exists to provide regular opportunities during the semester for the PC community to reflect on some of the deepest human things. Often we host guest lectures, but we have always emphasized the performing arts as well. And today we have the honor of presenting a lecture recital hosted by Providence College's own Catherine Gordon. Professor Gordon is professor and chair of the music department here at Providence College. She earned a master's degree in harpsichord performance from Indiana University and a master's and PhD in musicology from the University of Michigan. Her primary area of research concerns 17th century French secular and sacred airs. She's received a number of research fellowships, including a French government bourse and an award from the National Endowment for the Humanities. She's published articles and essays on various 17th century French music topics and published the book Music and the Language of Love, 17th Century French Airs, with Indiana University Press in 2011. Her recent book uh, and the foundation for today's concert recital is Catholicism as Musical Discourse, the reconversion of women through 17th century French sacred songs. It's a study of sacred songs composed primarily for women throughout the 17th century and will be released by Oxford University Press later this year. Professor Gordon is also a professional harpsichordist and performs regularly. And I'm also very happy to say that for many years she's helped the Humanities Forum include musical performances and guests in our regular schedules. It's a special honor to have her present for us here today. This lecture recital summarizes parts of Professor Gordon's Catholicism as Musical Discourse by focusing on an analysis and contextualization of the repertory rather than the theoretical framework as presented in the book. She's joined on stage today by the award-winning musical ensemble, La Donna Musicale, whom she will introduce to us in a moment. Please now join me in welcoming to the podium Professor Catherine Gordon. Thank you. Welcome. And, and thank you all so much for attending this event. And I'd like to thank Raymond Hain and the organizers of the Humanities Forum for sponsoring this lecture recital. Um, it's also my pleasure to introduce again La Dona Musicale, directed by Lowry Gutierrez, who will be performing several sacred songs this afternoon, the first time most of these songs have been heard in performance for over 300 years. La Dona Musicale is um, devoted to the discovery, preservation, and promotion of sacred and secular music coast composed by and for women and uses period instruments and historical performance practices. If any of you have any questions about these, uh, please feel free after the lecture recital to, to come up and speak with them or with me. And there will be, a, if, if time permitted, there'll be a, a question answer period as well after the event. Uh, this afternoon, I will be speaking about French sacred songs composed and published especially for women throughout the long 17th century. Sacred songs were non-liturgical and meant to be sung in domestic settings, salons, classrooms, or private chapels to serve educational, devotional, or recreational functions. The songs collections included either religious texts in French set to pre-existing tunes called either parodies or contrafacta, or newly written sacred texts set to new musical settings. With the help of La Donna Musicale, you will hear several examples of sacred songs that demonstrate changes in musical style, transformations over, over time in what lyrics communicated, as well as the different functions of the repertory over a 100-year period. In addition to presenting information about a repertory that has received little to no scholarly attention, our goal is to bring to life, once again, a forgotten but significant genre of music. Many of the songs you will hear today have not been sung over, for over 300 years, as I mentioned above. Although clues about the performance comes from what we know about singing secular songs, only a few sources address the performance of their sacred counterpart. 
All we know for sure about the repertory is that the practice was very flexible. In a few collections, for example, authors specified that readers should choose their own airs to sing to any given text if they did not know or did not like that, the one that was indicated. For newly composed songs, the melody could be sung alone, transposed to any key to fit a singer's range, and or played with a chordal accompaniment that includes a bass line that could be either sung, played, or both. Sacred songs for women not only determined what was communicated in the songs and how they were to be used, but also their musical properties. First and foremost, sacred songs needed to be easy for women to sing. Since many women could not read music very well or sing polyphony or in parts, most sacred songs were written for solo voice, either unaccompanied or with a basso continuo accompaniment, that is, one instrument playing the bass line and another adding chords and passage work to fill out the accompaniment. Sacred songs could be in the style of popular street tunes, drinking songs, chansons, courtly songs, serious airs, or later in the century, opera airs and recitatives. Whether parodies or newly composed texts and music, most were identified as cantiques spirituelles, chassons spirituelles, airs de dévotion, or airs spirituelles. On the left, you'll see a newly composed sacred lyrics, which are to be sung to the secular tune identified right above. To the right, you see another contrafacta with the original melody of the secular tune, though slightly altered, set to the, to the new sacred text. In this example, the melody appears on the left and the bass line on the right. The bass line could be sung, sung and played, with or without chordal accompaniment. The, the uh, original tune is also indicated above the score. To give you an idea of what a sacred song sounds like, La Donna Musicale will now perform Rose en qui je vois paraître. This song is included in a collection published in 1699, so later in the century.
100 years before Rose en qui je vois paraître was published in 1699, Catholic leaders in France embarked upon a mission to reform the Catholic Church. Among other areas for reform, members of the clergy recognized that many people from all walks of life and social positions were unfamiliar with basic principles of Catholicism and so vowed to rectify this deficiency. It was not enough for individuals to live their religion through ritual and routine action alone. Fundamental to post-reform Catholicism was the conviction that to be a true Christian required individuals to have knowledge of their religion. To this end, the members of the clergy set out to re-educate the public in Catholic doctrine, alter the way that Catholicism was practiced among the laity, and instill a profound and personal understanding of the Catholic religion. Music became one of the most important tools used by reformers. Members of the clergy believed that singing sacred songs in particular not only facilitated a deeper spiritual experience, but also proved to, to be an efficacious means of teaching basic principles of Catholicism. Most important, whether contrafacta of pre-existing tunes or newly composed melodies, sacred lyrics were written primarily by members of the clergy who belonged to different orders with varying, even controversial, interpretations of Catholic thought that were communicated through their collections, songs, dedications, and introductions. It's no surprise that contrafacta of pre-existing tunes constitute the majority of sacred songs published earlier in the century, because women especially would have been familiar with the most popular songs of the day. Since they were already familiar with the melodies, it was easy to switch out the secular lyrics and replace them with sacred texts. Several collections of contrafacta from earlier in the century also condoned religious mysticism during this period, a practice that appealed to many women. Written during the 1630s, Jean-Joseph Surin's Spiritual Cantique, which were contrafacta of popular tunes, were well known for their promotion of mystical operations. Surin's first collection was published in Bordeaux in 1655, followed by publications in Paris of almost 20 editions between 1660 and 1731. Surin was a Jesuit priest, mystic, and exorcist best known for his successful exorcism of Jean des Anges, the mother superior at the Ursuline convent in Loudun during the 1630s. According to Surin, during the exorcism, he was himself overcome by demons as they passed from her body to his own. For almost 20 years, Surin labored to extricate himself from a state of damnation. His cantiques are, autobi cantique are autobiographical, recount his battle with demonic possession, and describe in personal and expressive language the different stages associated, uh, the different stages associated with the search for unity with God while battling his demons. His cantiques were especially popular amongst nuns, lay women, and influential noble women who were attracted to mysticism. Over the course of the 17th century, however, the church became more and more concerned, particularly about women who self-identified as mystics and eventually would prohibit the practice. The intensely emotional, sensual, and mystical expression of love for the divine in Surin's Cantique represent what scholars have identified as the feminized side of the Catholic reform. His superiors even proclaimed that Surin's life and works reflected quote, the tastes or sentiments of femlet, or little women, a derogatory reference referring to an overly sensual and experiential approach to religious practices and the tears and sensitivities that certain women have who engage in mystical operations. Sauvin's collection is divided into three groups of lyrics that represent three stages in the pursuit of Christian perfection, the purgative, illuminative, and unitive. The first level is identified as the practice of meditation on subjects like the life and death of Jesus, the lives of saints, the sacraments, and so on. 
The second level of meditation is described as effective meditation, which requires that one abandon oneself to passion as she ventures into the realm of the senses and a deeper level of meditation on love for God and Jesus. The third level was referred to as passive contemplation. Francis de Sales indicates in his treatise on the love of God that at this highest level of the spiritual quest, the soul enjoys unmediated contact with the divinity. La Donna Musicale will now perform an excerpt from Saran's collection that represents the extreme pain one feels during the second stage of mystical operations, the illuminative. Cantique sur l'hôpital de l'amour sacré is about being so ill with God's love that one ends up in his divine hospital. Each verse features a different saint who endured the horrors that Jesus suffered while on the cross, open lesions, pierced feet, hands, chest, abdomen, and so forth. The group will be performing two verses um, about Saint, uh, Saint Teresa of Avila, a female mystic whom Sorin greatly admired. Despite the gruesome images, the tune indicated in Saran's first publication from 1655 for this cantique is a drinking song in major mode, simple and light, an expression which seems contrary to the seriousness of the text. Miguel will sing the original drinking song, Contre mon gré, which will be followed by the same tune set to Saran's lyrics. In the second edition, published in Paris in 1660, Two other song options are indicated. One of these is J'aime bien quand je suis aimé, a song dance in minor, a dance song in minor mode. You may notice that this melody is more refined, complex, and more challenging to sing than the previous drinking song, which would have appealed to more sophisticated noble women familiar with the most popular Parisian songs. The original air will be followed by the same tune set to Saran's lyrics. Thank you. 
While the majority of Sorin's cantiques are contrafacta of popular drinking songs and street tunes from the early 17th century, Francois Berthaud's devotional airs are contrafacta of mid-century serious airs. Composers of airs in this new style sought to create a musical representation of the tones of voice and rates of speech associated with an impassioned recitation of an air's text. Berthaud's devotional airs differ from Sorin's in several ways. Berthaud's uh, songs are directed towards female courtiers who are not expected to reach the highest levels of devotion. Influenced by the teachings of Francis de Sales, by mid-century, the church's initiatives coincided with a renewed evaluation of a woman's place in society called the Querelle des Femmes, a debate concerning the status, ability, and value of women that, for some, combined Christian virtues with courtly ideas of refined, honorable, and noble behavior. Those engaged in the debate argued that any women, any woman, even noble women at court, could attain a degree of agency and a sense of identity by living a pious life. Berthold belonged to the Cordelier, a branch of the Franciscan order, and was known for his efforts to popularize piety and reach out to members of polite society. As such, his heirs were created to appeal to a female religious sensibility that reached into women's private spaces, be it home or convent, as part of a continuation of the Catholic reform. The heirs from Book I, 1656, in particular, represent a Christian version of honnêteté and galanterie in line with ideals associated with the querelle des femmes. Thus, a morality of virtue and honorability mixed with a type of sociability involving good taste and wit. <laughs> Leading a pious life need not be difficult for courtiers or honorable women, referred to as honnête femme. All kinds of activities undertaken by a courtier could be honnête and galant when instructive and agreeable. A courtier was not expected to act like a nun or philosopher. No mention of religious mysticism, complicated theological doctrine, or the pain associated with the higher levels of devotion is evident in Berthold's songs. Rather, the lyrics focus on love of Jesus and God and paraphrase in courtly language passages from the Song of Songs. Berthold's parody on the right, for example, is a contrafacta setting of Michel Lambert's original secular air on the left. You'll notice that Berthold altered only a few words from the original, thus maintaining to a great extent the amorous rhetoric and, rhetoric and the meaning of the first version. La Donna Musicale will now perform an original air by Michel Lambert, Mon Coeur qui seront à vos coups, followed by Berthold's contrafacta of this air, Jésus les tourments. These will be followed by a toccata from Elizabeth Jacquet or by Elizabeth Jacquet Laguerre. translations to all, all the songs at the back of your uh, program, in case you didn't notice. <clears throat>
During the second half of the 17th century, several female teaching orders, such as the Ursulines, founded institutions of education for young girls. In his Airs, uh, Air Spirituel from 1672, 77, and 88, Bertrand de Bassy makes it clear that his spiritual airs should be the only songs used to teach girls how to sing in convent schools or at home, since secular songs were filled with lascivious lyrics that corrupted young minds. His second edition from 1688, in particular, was reorganized and edited to accommodate their theological function. I argue that the, that the pedagogical, pedagogical practices espoused by the most influential 17th century pedagogues, um, their use of maxims, emphasis on memorization, repetition, recitation, and theories on expressing the passions are revealed not necessarily by what Bassi says, but rather through compositional strategies revealed through an analysis of his sacred songs, which included both vocal preludes and spiritual airs. Bassi claims that he added lyrics in the form of maxims to his vocal preludes to aid in memorization in both of both the religious texts and music, especially when learned by rote students imitating their teachers. Just as students learning how to read break down sentences into letters, syllables, words, and phrases, so too preludes in particular can be broken down into its components, each phrase offering technical challenges like difficult intervallic combinations or florid ornamentation that once memorized and, con and conquered can be applied to singing the spiritual airs that follow each prelude. Most important, through memorization and repetition of music and text, girls would internalize the sacred lyrics in order to create pious young women. Bassi's preludes and airs are not contrafacta, but rather newly written melodies, many set to lyrics by Jacques Testu, who was a preacher under King Louis XIV and beginning in 1674, the director of the Académie Française. Bassi himself also composed lyrics as well as all the musical settings. Bassi was one of the most prolific and influential composers of songs of all kinds, including serious airs, spiritual airs, drinking songs, dance songs, and so forth, and was frequently a guest at the most notable Parisian salons where his airs would have been performed by and for the social elite. He was an entrepreneur earning money by teaching voice to eminent nobles and notables by selling his own editions of heirs. He was also a non-practicing priest and so received a modest ecclesiastic income throughout his life. Jacques Testu in particular and Bassi by association were connected to Jansenists and a group of women from the upper nobility known as the rigorous penitents who aligned themselves with Jansenist theology. Jansenists held a rather pessimistic view of a human's natural inclinations as represented in their interpretations of writings by St. Augustine. Jansenists believe that man's nature had been damaged by original sin and had little capacity for good. They argued that a man could only achieve salvation through God's grace and so believed in predestination, meaning only those predetermined by God would be redeemed by his divine spirit. Jansenist concepts, phrases, and words appear throughout Bassi's lyrics. Like the Jansenists, his spiritual songs prescribe the necessity of self-isolation from society and self-reflection. References include the miserable conditions brought on by Adam's fall that tainted humankind, salvation for only a few, and extreme humility. Also stress was the necessity for prayer or to liberate oneself from the material world and its vanities and charms. One was also expected to practice a sustained effort at penitence since the sinner is always in danger of falling from grace. La Donna Musicale will sing two excerpts from Bassi's collection. The first, A Compasseur, is an example of an unmeasured vocal prelude. 
And you'll notice that there, uh, there is a key signature, but no measure lines. To our knowledge, basis are the only examples of vocal preludes of this kind ever written. Even though a meter is ed indicated, there are no measure lines, meaning that they needed to be sung in an improvisational manner, manner to create, in Bassi's words, quote, a complicated flight of musical imagination, unquote. Each prelude is followed by a series of spiritual airs in the same key. Once a student mastered a prelude, learning to sing airs would be much easier. As such, Basi's vocal preludes would be used to teach beginners how to sing, to set the mode or key for the following pieces, to warm up the, vocal, the voice throughout the vocal range, and to practice vocal agility. The following song, a sacred air, Du vient cette sombre tristesse, is typical of Basi's spiritual airs. Despite the harsh lyrics, they are written to appeal to female courtiers and young girls learning how to sing, by enveloping the rigorous meaning of the lyrics in an appealing and familiar language, syntax, vocabulary, and music in the style of popular secular airs. Like adding sugar to bitter medicine, rigorous verses set to Bassi's sweet music could entice singers to sing pleasurable and even passionate melodies while internalizing the most austere of lyrics.
We close our presentation with pieces from four collections published between 1699 and 1705. French sacred songs written primarily for women changed significantly over the long 17th century. During this period, different factions of the Catholic Church promoted controversial, um, let's see, Different factions of the church promoted controversial interpretations of Catholic theology that were expressed through various collections written with a particular readership in mind. While earlier in the, sex, in the century, sacred contrafacta of popular songs and courtly airs, many published in the provinces, were set to Baroque style lyrics with a focus on catechesis and mystic operations. Mid-century, Contrafacta on stylish, serious airs emphasized love for Jesus, which appealed to female courtiers or honnet uh, femmes in Paris. Bertrand de Bassi composed his own sacred songs set to lyrics that expressed a rigorous theology for women of the social elite who sympathized with Jansenism and for young girls learning how to sing. By the turn of the century, however, sacred songs offered something for everyone. Despite Louis XIV's religious conversion after 1680 and a turn towards austere piety at court, most, uh, the more pleasant and positive side of religious devotion dominated most sacred airs at the end of the century. Collections also included several songs for two or more singers, which for the first time required male voices. The majority of sacred so lyrics were not written by members of the clergy, but rather by the most well-known poets and authors of the day, such as Jean Racine. Instead of women singing sacred songs for private devotion, the function of many songs was for group recreation and a religious experience shared by men and women. The songs could also be grouped into separate movements to form vocal cantatas. Many composers added instrumental introductions and accompaniments that required both soloists and choirs, taking the performance of sacred songs out of private spaces and into public venues. By the turn of the century, all sides of the religious controversy that previously plagued the church in France were represented throughout the repertory. No matter the message, however, it was communicated in an agreeable and familiar literary and musical style. A positive turn of phrase and vocabulary was accompanied by pleasant and even beautiful music. Pious topics were packaged in a common and conventional language and set to musical styles that were most fashionable, functioning as pleasurable entertainments that everyone could enjoy. La Donna Musicale will now perform our final four sacred songs and a trio sonata 
by Elizabeth Jacquet de la Guerre.
What a way to make a <laughs> final statement. If anybody has any questions, please uh, feel free to, to ask us or just come up and talk to our performers. <laughs>